Ready to go? Looks like we're ready, Corey. All right, we're ready to roll. Just give me the, tell me to, when to go. No. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, well, welcome. Welcome to the, uh, I believe this is the fourth town hall, Thursday, May 14th. We're gonna talk about um, managing uncertainty. Last week, we, we talked a little bit about tolerating uncertainty, what it was, um, you know, what to do and how to deal with it. Now, moving forward, uh, this week is, is uh, things are changing and we're going to be going back to work. So we'll, we'll touch a little bit on that. But first, I'll introduce myself. My name is Corey Hirsch. I'm a former National Hockey League player. Uh, I suffer from anxiety and depression, obsessive com uh, compulsive disorder. I was diagnosed with while I was playing uh, and the stigma of mental health uh, really affected my play and, and how I, I move forward in my life. Now I uh, am doing very well. Uh, I work with Sportsnet 650. I'm a broadcaster on all the Vancouver Canucks games, and I'll be your uh, host today. And let's meet our panel. Welcome back, Melissa and Anne-Marie. It's great to have you guys back. Melissa is a psychologist at Vancouver CBT Center, uh, and her area of specialization is cognitive behavior therapy, CBT, and she specializes in general anxiety disorder. Um, articles, um, you know, everything. She's written a ton of stuff on all of this stuff. Um, and uh, she was a former president of the Canadian Association of Cognitive and Behavioral Therapies. Man, that's all tough to say, <laughs> but we'll get through it. Um, she's with us today. Her expertise is welcome. She's a lovely lady. And we'll talk it now, uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Albano. She's a professor of medical psychology at Columbia University and founder of the Columbia University Clinic for Anxiety-Related Disorders. Uh, published uh, tons of articles, 150 articles, chapters, uh, co-author of several uh, cognitive behavioral treatment manuals. Uh, and she has a book, a book with Leslie Pepper. We didn't mention that last week. It's called uh -oh. Doing Your Anxious Child. She is the go-to on all specialty with children. So we're going to get into some of that today. But let's just uh, recap a little bit of last week, uh, tolerating uncertainty, what uncertainty is. And we're still in that uh, format, really, right now with what's going to happen and moving forward. Uh, everything's kind of reopening and there's so much uncertainty around it. But last week we talked about you know, where you get your information, Anne-Marie, and sticking to the facts. I think that's important uh, you know, for everybody moving forward. Let's stick to the facts. Um, and how's that going to affect us moving forward, going back to work? Well, you know, it's so important about getting your information about the virus, about what can happen and about moving back into your everyday lives. What's important about getting your information from reputable sources is that they're doing the work. They know what this is. They are learning how to manage it and it does take time and they know how to keep us safe. But if you're all over the place, all over the web, if you're listening to all kinds of pundits and opinions and your next door neighbor and Aunt Sally who lives in Arizona or wherever, you can get so many different opinions that mix you up. Don't go down that hole, right? Stick with our CDC in the US, your National Health Service, stick with the experts who can guide us and help us to then be safe. Now that's great advice. And Melissa, you talked about the pandemic buddy. What exactly is that and what does that entail? Well, I can't take credit for that. That's actually someone <laughs> that was that was that was that was a client of mine who mentioned that that talking about how how isolating it is, especially if you live alone, um, to sort of, you know, um, to basically have this sort of extended period of isolation that we've had for several months. And because we're such social creatures. So um, I had a client who very, very, um, who very wisely said, I think everyone needs a pandemic partner, someone that you agree that you're going to check in on and you're going to talk with and, and, you know, just to feel like, you know, like someone's sort of looking out for you and checking in on you and that you're checking in on them. So yes, everyone needs to have a, pande a pandemic partner or a pandemic buddy. I think that's great advice. And with mental health, that's, that's kind of how I live. I, you know, that's how we all, we all need somebody to, that can help check in and check in on others. I think that's, uh, it's such an important thing. And 
I love that term pandemic, buddy. I'm going to steal that. But moving forward, um, Anne-Marie, all the rules are being relaxed now a little bit, but there's going to still be some some stuff in place, social isolation or, or not isolation, but social distancing. Um, you know, what is this going to look like for somebody that has anxiety uh, or, you know, issues along those, those ways? What can they do to control going back to work and getting back into the workforce? Because... Um, for all of us, we really don't know what to expect moving forward. This is uncertain times. Right. So this is the time now where, again, if when we think of it this way, about nine weeks ago, we all went into high anxiety. Everyone did, because what is this? What's it going to mean? We went into sheltering in place and we started to get comfortable in our sheltering in place while we're listening and maybe there's rises of anxiety with this information, that information, what's happening. But we've developed these routines now of being at home for the most part and how to use masks and wash your hands. Now things are gonna start opening up and they're gonna start opening up in different places at different times and in different sectors of our communities at different times. So for example, takeout, there's still gonna be, you could now go to the restaurant and get takeout, but not all restaurants will have in-house seating because it's about the distancing. So there's gonna be different things that are going on. And when you think about the anxiety you have about maybe going back to work, is my workplace gonna be safe? How are we gonna handle this? Oh my gosh, we're a big office and so forth. Well, it is incumbent on those who are running businesses and healthcare centers, our dentists. I just got a letter from my dentist's office today about how they are going to be reopening and what that will mean for us. So you're gonna get instructions. Pay attention to the instructions from your employers and others that you would go out to into the environment. Wear your mask, take you know your gloves with you, have hand sanitizer where you're going and follow the plan. I think the thing we have to know is what we've learned is arming us against unhelpful anxiety it's arming us to be prepared. And that's key. Know what we can control, know what things should look like. And if you come up to a place, a restaurant, let's say where you're supposed to pick things up, but people are milling around, crowding around. Okay, step back, turn around, wait and see what happens. Call the restaurant and ask what's going on because you might not then wanna go in, but be smart about it, okay? It doesn't mean hide, but it means be smart. Yeah, uh, and you know, we're, we're not alone. We're all going to be feeling the same way. Everybody going back to work is going to be feeling the same as the person beside them. And Melissa, I'll ask you pretty much the same question. Um, you know, what do you expect from people that have high anxiety? How can they manage it? What is something, you know, someone goes to work, um, they've been around people, now they got to come back home to their family. And their they're, anxiety can give us um, unrealistic worries and fears. How do you control that coming back to your family um, and just managing that anxiety and fear of something along those lines? Yeah. So in a very real way, um, Anne-Marie was, you know, was mentioning that, that this sort of new normal is actually really quite anxiety provoking because you get used to sort of being at home, et cetera. But I would say that it's actually, there's even another layer, which is that we're not opening completely. Certain things are open, certain things are not. Even schools, some places are opening schools and some are not. And what's interesting is that they're saying for a lot of things, it's voluntary. So there's a choice. So here we have a bit of uncertainty, more uncertainty of do I do this or not? Do I send my kids to school? Do I go to work? Do I, do I walk into that restaurant to get my takeout? if there's a lot of people, because other people are there, they seem to be okay with it. So should I be okay with it or should I not? So there's an individual judgment as to how much uncertainty or how much risk tolerance we're going to have. And I mentioned this last time, like there's gonna be variations. So for mm -hmm. example, I know, I, I know people who have chosen uh, that, um, um, who have chosen to not have their kids go back to school for June and I know people who have, and they have different reasons. And I would say that in both cases, it's the right decision because that's the thing about uncertainty and about anxiety. It's not, it's not the right choice, the right life, the right decision. That doesn't exist. 
You know, I used to say to people that, you know, um, if you really wanted to be successful, if I wanted to be fabulously successful and known the world over, all I would need to do is write the book of normal because everybody wants the book of normal. Everybody wants to do the right thing, except that it doesn't exist, right? So you have to sort of figure out you know, balancing. So here's the, you know, here's what, here's what my, you know, um, health authorities are telling me and here's what's happening. And there's my anxiety in the middle saying, Ooh, you shouldn't do that. So then how am I going to figure out what's going to work for me? And I said this before, you can have ideas about what you think is right for you when you're anxious. I don't want to do anything. You know what? I just want to stay home. I just want to stay home for the next year. And that's okay to have that idea. But, but anxiety rises and falls. It's like a tide. You must know this, Corey. You know, even if you have really high anxiety, you're not anxious all the time. You got your moments of anxiety and your moments when you're calmer. So I was, you know, like my general advice for a lot of things is just wait. Give it a second. Give yourself a, a chance to dial down. And what is a good decision? What is the right decision? Will continue to be the right decision when you're calm. Right. But you might change your mind when you've dialed it down a bit. So, you know, you can have an idea of, like, you know, like, OK, well, I don't want to do that. It's like, all right, you don't have to do that right now. Give yourself a second to dial down. And, you know, um, I always think it as, you know, activate your rational mind based on what I know and the cost of staying in my house for the next year. Is this really what I want to do? Yeah, I, that's I love that you said that, because I used to live my life like everything was on fire right put out the fire put out the fire and and that's and then what i've learned to do is you don't make good decisions when that happens so you have to learn that yes your anxiety it will pass it'll, and it, you're better off waiting for your anxiety to pass and then make you can make a better decision because uh you know it, it doesn't it clouds our, our judgment sometimes having that anxiety and i'm glad that you said that because um and we there's so many of us and people that feel that way it's uh it's just you're right if I can just, sometimes I just got to bat down the hatches and just wait for stuff to pass. But you also brought up another good point, which was children. And Anne-Marie, you're, you're our children uh, expert. Um, there's some things that going back to school entail for people right now. And there's some worry about that. And, um, you know, what do you say to our listeners out there that are worried about having their children go back to school? Well, this is, uh, you know, this is something that's evolving, evolving because, um, the schools, and I've been working here in the U.S. with different school associations and schools on getting prepared to bring kids back. What is going to be needed? How are they going to do that? Um, do it safely. And then also around just helping the kids to be coping and families to be coping in this time of uh, doing schooling at home. But something that's emerged and is, is happening right now is a focus on a syndrome that seems to be happening in children who have been um, exposed to COVID, but it's about four to six weeks later that they develop, some kids have developed a COVID-like syn syndrome. Here in uh, New York state, there's been a hundred cases and of those about five children have died. Um, what this looks like is fever, decreased energy, loss of appetite, Apparently the children's lips and tongue may look very red. Um, and so the, our, our CDC, Centers for Disease Control, our New York State Health Department and other departments around the country are taking a very close look at this and they're trying to get on this right away. So this is scaring parents, of course, and, and making us concerned because you know the idea that the kids aren't affected by COVID, which was something that was passed around at first, you know, is not true. And then we have to understand what this is. So I think schools are going to be very, very cautious and we need to give our physicians and scientists in the medical field time again to, over the next couple of months to understand what this is and try to get ahead of it. So I would caution people to pay attention again to your health experts. If anything is going on with a child that looks like what I just said, you call your pediatrician immediately. Um, and they will guide you as to what to do to protect your kids. And then school systems are thinking through, I think the whole state of ca the California um, university system has decided they are not opening in the fall. You know, University of California um, campuses, I believe are not opening. That's one of the largest um, college systems in our country. And so there are some education 
um, uh, associations and education uh, programs that are not going to be opening until they know how they can do that safely. I imagine in Canada, your uh, education folks are going through the same kind of thing of planning and thinking these things through. Yeah, and it's that's very well said. I mean, there's it's just uncertain times, but we need to listen to the experts. Um, you know, Melissa, and I'll, I'll ask this. People are, are going back to work and they're going to be back into scenarios. We, we talked a little bit about it at the start, um, you know, where they're going to be anxious. How do you support a friend or a family member that, um, you know, Melissa, that might be struggling with something? What kind of support can you give somebody that um, they're going to have to go back into the workplace, but they are feeling extremely anxious about it? Yeah, you know, anxiety, unfortunately, there's no magic pill. I mean, even though there's medication that's going to make it go away immediately, right? And people, by the way, have that sort of feeling like I'm anxious and I really need to get rid of this feeling right now. And you know what? It's like we have anxiety. I mentioned this last time, right? Like um, we have anxiety when we are um, uh, in real danger, but we can also have anxiety experienced as a false alarm, right? Sort of when we think we're in danger, right? And, um, but whether it's happening because we perceive a danger or there's an actual danger, it's a real thing that's going on, right? Physically, it's a whole firestorm. And in our mind, you have all these like racing thoughts and that's an unpleasant thing. So coming back to your question, Corey, sometimes the best thing you can do is just sort of be there for someone, right? There's nothing to fix. Um, you know, you're not in physical danger when you're anxious. It's not pleasant, but it's not dangerous. Um, and I don't think you need to, to freak out when you see somebody being anxious. Just having a chance to talk through what's bothering you, sometimes problem solving in a rational way, uh, things that people are concerned about is probably the best way to sort of look at how do I handle anxiety and how do I support someone, right? Um, you don't necessarily, like what, what we don't wanna do is to rush into reassurance seeking um, or, you know, sort of saying things that, you know, really aren't going to, you know, like aren't going to be terribly compelling. Everything will be fine. You'll be great. Everything will be fine. That's the problem. That's why we're anxious. Nobody can tell you that. Nobody can guarantee you. And trying to tell people that, especially when they're anxious, doesn't fly, right? I mean, when we feel anxious, we perceive a threat, even if it's really, really unlikely. And, you know, I, I, I kind of come back to, I absolutely agree with Anne-Marie. There's all these things that we need to be really mindful of, um, but there's going to be individual variation for like risk, you know, like, so for example, we know like, uh, you know, for those who go into work, past a certain age, and if you have a compromised immune system, that's probably not something that you're going to want to do. Right. So if you have, you know, um, if your child has asthma and some other things, you know what I mean? Like you might be a bit more hesitant right. uh, for them to go back, even if it feels generally safe. And the school, um, you know, really seems to be taking it seriously. Right. Um, so there's going to always be some individual variation um, uh, and, you know, like in a balance of risk tolerance. That's why I said, you know, the best way to not have to deal with anything is just is just just stay locked up for the next year or two. But I say this to everyone, the best way to avoid potential negative things is to just, well, just avoid everything. Just stay locked up in a hermetically sealed room. And then you will never have to deal with anything. Of course, now you're locked up in a hermetically sealed room. You probably don't have much of a life going on. So like, what's the cost, right? And we always have to kind of balance how much risk um, I'm taking and what's the cost to me. And that's going to, and that equation is going to be different for different people. There's you know, so when much. I, I, yeah, oh, go ahead, Corey, thinking about yeah. the question and Melissa, you're right. One of the things that just came to mind, you ask, you know, when you ask about what could we do for friends or colleagues as you're, you know, heading back to work and such. And I think about, you know, another thing maybe is how about coping colleagues? How about getting a couple of people together on the phone or on Zoom at from your office or wherever it is that you work to talk about, okay, we're gonna go back whenever we're gonna go back, whether you're a hairdresser or you're a restaurant worker or whatever you might do, you work in an office building. What can we do together to think about how to make our workspace 
uh, you know, safe for us? What are the things we need to know and help one another with and to arrange for distancing and such and what kind of supplies we might want to have on hand? Uh -huh. If you get your work colleagues together and especially whoever the administrators are to, you know, agree and work on this, then you have, you have everybody then together working on each other's side and you don't feel alone you have actual tangible plans that are reasonable, right? And if somebody is out of the range of reason, we could bring them in together. Um, and you know, you know, you know that you're all together as a team looking out for one another. That is what's making me feel good about my workspace and my and the people I work with, because we've been doing that. And I suggest others do it too. Uh, this is such great information. You can find all of it on anxietycanada.com, uh, on Twitter, anxiety underscore Canada. Uh, so much great information. And I, I just to back up what you had said, uh, both of you, if you're a manager or a boss, um, it's so important to check in with your employees and how they're and how they're doing. Um, their feelings are real. Their, their anxieties are real. They're just like yours. And nobody's alone in this. Right. We need to make sure that everybody's together in this, that we're all feeling the same thing. So some uh, uh, some great advice from both of you on that. Um, and just check in with your employees, check in with, with people and, and just see how they're doing. Um, you know, and Anne-Marie, I'll ask you this, we'll, we'll go back to children. There's going to be children going back to school that A, they're not going to want to go back to school because what kid does, right? So they might be saying, uh, you know, I'm a little anxious about going back to school, but for the majority of them, they're going to be anxious going back to school too. How do you deal with a child? that is going back into a classroom that does feel uh, anxious themselves? Yeah, that's a very good question because I think at different ages, there'll be kids who are more or less anxious, just, you know, little ones, don't really think about anxiety in the same way everybody else does necessarily. They might get separation anxious or such, but just the average kid will, you know, just bound into a kindergarten class. But when you head towards high school and college, kids are thinking more about risk. Um, and also, again, the way anxiety presents those who are more um, inclined towards feeling more anxious and having anxiety disorders, it's gonna be much more difficult for them. Another thing is kids who are marginalized. Um, or more isolated, children who are LGBT, uh, kids who come from a minority status, let's say, or disadvantaged backgrounds. There's, it's tougher for them. They feel a bit more relief sometimes being at, at home than not being the focus of negative attention. And then there are kids who have been home in difficult circumstances where they're waiting to get back to school because it's a relief for them. So we have the schools are gonna be receiving a range of different kinds of kids, right? And their reactions. The things we need to do is help our kids, number one, uh, for whatever age they are, know what they're capable of. They are capable of washing hands. Um, they're capable of saying, hey, wait, we, I wanna keep, I'm not going to work so close with you on this school project. We've gotta sit a little bit further from one another. Parents can help their kids to learn some of the distancing and safety strategies that we're all doing. Uh, it'll be up to schools. We'll see what happens with masks. It's hard for younger children to wear masks, but not for older. I would say let the kids make their own masks, put whatever the heck their favorite hockey team or whoever, you know, on the mask, let them do it. Why not? It's like wearing, you know, sweatshirts with your favorite sports or college on it and such. These are the things we have to let them express themselves the way they want to and they feel good about so that they feel good about going into school like that. So I would say that should be welcoming. And then again, I think it's up to the schools to present to the families before the kids come back what we're doing to keep you all safe. And one of the big things will be no kid with a fever. So parents take their take the kid's temperature before they get to school and I bet they're taken at school. So there's a number of things, but we have to help the kids to understand in the ways they know and can handle what's being made safe for them and what they can do to be safe. Well, and as long as those masks are New York Rangers masks, we're good. There you go, right? <laughs> <laughs> Now, Melissa, you had something you wanted to add. Was it to our previous conversation or? Yeah, I just, I loved, I just loved what um, Anne-Marie said about like uh, coping colleagues, because you know what? Um, and, and I'm sure everyone can resonate with this. Like, have you ever noticed how we're so much better at solving other people's problems as opposed to our own? It's, you know, like, we're, like almost everyone is. And the reason is because when it's our problem, 
Um, anxiety interferes, you know, it's like we basically can't see the forest from the trees. Um, but when it's somebody else's problem, we can empathize, but because we're not feeling directly threatened, we can sort of think about it more rationally, contextually. But it is the difference between being in a hedge maze, sort of trying to figure it out, versus looking at it from the top, right? So this idea of having a coping colleague is really just someone who can help you kind of look at a situation a bit differently, a bit more contextually. And, and, you know, like, you know, so, you know, like, I'm worried about this issue at work and, oh my, you know, like, and, you know, about what if people come up and talk to me and how I, and, and how am I going to deal with this? And, and is it rude if I say, Hey, I need you to keep, you know, uh, um, you know, like six feet from me, you know, um, how am I going to do this? And so you might have a friend who would, you know, sort of help you brainstorm. Well, you could say it like this, or you could, you know, you could make a joke or you could put a little line around your desk or whatever. Right. And so sometimes just having someone talk with you, um, and sort of, you know, like I said, sort of make sense of it in a way that we can't when, when, when our anxiety muddies it up is a great idea. You know, pandemic partner, you know, <laughs> there you go. colleague, I tell you. <laughs> you know what, that, that's, uh, that'll lead me into something that, um, that I've, you know, is kind of near and dear to me is, um, you know, is masculinity. And um, during the time like this, uh, you know, I know that there's a lot of men that feel anxiety and depression or whatever it is, and they're going to feel anxious too. But, um, you know, due to, you know, being a man, what is it? Does a man go get help and all that? Um, I'll, I'll just, from my point of view, um, I struggled severely during while I was playing in the National Hockey League with anxiety. Um, so I had to go to the rink every day and I felt like less of a man and, and all that stuff and the shame and the guilt and, uh, is anybody, and what I found was, is everybody felt, you know, everybody feels anxiety. I wasn't alone. There was tons of us out there. Um, so I reached out and I went and got help and guess what? Uh, and Anne Marie, you can speak to this too. Um, I can still be a man. I'm still a man. I got help. I can still have a beer. I can still play rec hockey. I can still get in fights in rec hockey. I might get my butt kicked. I probably will, but, uh, I'm still doing all those manly things. I haven't changed. And my life is dealing with anxiety is so much better um and getting help was the masculine thing to do suffering in silence was not the masculine thing to do in, in my opinion and it just shows moving forward that in something like this i want to let uh all men out there know that you know we're in uncertain times feeling anxiety feeling anxious right now is okay that you're not alone. There's a lot of us that are feeling anxious. Uh, and this just isn't masculine. This goes to females too as well um, for you know feeling ashamed or guilty for reaching out for help uh, or feeling like you're a burden. No, we're all in this together. And this goes to speak to the buddy system of this pandemic that we've been talking about. Um, and Anne-Marie, what do you say to a man or female out there that feels like they just can't ask for help that you know, it's not, it's a, they don't want to be a burden or they don't, you know, they feel ashamed for asking for help. You know, one of the first things I, I think I, I do is I validate the, whatever they're feeling is so real and uh, so natural for the situation. Um, so much a part of being a human being. So own it and, ex and experience it. Let yourself first understand yourself and allow yourself to feel that. That's, that's first and foremost, um, because any attempts at squashing it, denying it, uh, pushing it away, hiding from it, uh, only makes you feel worse and it locks you up. You're not able then you know, to get the help that you need. And the second thing is there's such courageousness in saying, this is what's happening with me. And, and it, that takes courage and it validates again that you are able to speak and it opens you up. Find the person that you can say that to who will hear you. And that may be someone in your life. It may be a friend, a relative, a best buddy or someone. Think about that. It, it also could be one of us who are therapists. Find someone who will allow you to say that for the first time 
this is what's happening to me. I'm frightened if I go back to work and I bring this thing back to my wife and kids or my, you know, when then what have I done to them? Find someone who's going to hear that and, and, and say, and especially there are so many great programs and groups and networks for men, the Good Men Project being one, and there are all kinds of networks for men. There are guys out there just like Corey who are waiting to say, come on, we're here, we got your back because we're doing the same thing. We're feeling the same thing. We're working the same thing. So that's what I would say is, is validate yourself, find the one or find the group and get it out. Uh, very, so well said. Um, and it was, it was honestly like a piano fell off my back that I wasn't hiding at anymore. And then what I found was, is that there are millions of men just like me that struggle with anxiety and that, you know, suffering in silence is not the answer. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it's not good for anybody around you. Uh, Melissa, I'll, I'll just ask too, as well for you, um, you know, what do you, uh, how do you, how do you talk to a partner that you know is struggling that isn't wanting to get help? So listen, I, I um, great question. Um, I did want to sort of expand on, Please do. Um, yeah, on, on uh, what you both said, because I'm always fascinated by the fact, you're absolutely right, that it is harder for men to admit that they have anxiety because for some reason we've decided that that means weakness in some way right it's like that if you're that if you're like if you're a man or if you're just tough if you're strong you don't have anxiety like you're fearless but here's the thing there's nothing impressive about fearlessness okay because fearlessness just means no anxiety all right like when i like when i would go to work every day i would fearlessly take the elevator which is not terribly impressive because i'm not afraid of elevators but here's the thing, if I told you that I was afraid of elevators and I took that elevator every day, that's brave. Like when, when Anne-Marie mentions courage, like it is harder to, to acknowledge anxiety yeah. and to face it. You have, I mean, contrary to popular opinion, anxiety is not for the weak. Um, I work, I mean, I do CBT for anxiety. The work that I ask people to do is hard. And you have to be strong to be willing to overcome anxiety. So, you know, we need to kind of associate strength and masculinity, not with not having anxiety, but with, but with having it and braving the storm and doing things anyways. I mean, if you went through CBT, Corey, I know you had to do tough things, <laughs> right? You had to walk across the fire, <laughs> right? Yeah. No. You know? like, yeah. So that like, when it comes to like talking about, you know, um, uh, you know, sort of seeking out help, you know, like when it comes to a partner or yourself, you know, it, I always frame it in a language of strength, you know, like that, that, um, that it's, you know, it's tough to go out and say, yeah, I need help with this, but of course you need help with it. When have you ever learned these tools? I mean, why do we, you know, like, is it brave to say to your, or, or like, is it tough to say to your partner? Like, seems like you have a toothache. You should go see someone. Let's <laughs> talk about that. It's like, no, I, I don't know how to fix my own teeth. I'll get someone to help me with that. There's nothing wrong with that. It's like, hey, I have this anxiety that I don't know how to deal with. Why don't I get someone to help me to deal with that? There shouldn't be anything wrong with that. It's not weak. In fact, it's harder, like I said, to face it going to get off my soapbox now. <laughs> no, this is great. That's fantastic. This is a whole nother show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We could I, go this out, is... out about this for hours. And I, I just, mm -hmm. I love what you both have said because uh, I've, I've lived it. And yes, the, I, I did a therapy called ERP, which was like CBT on steroids. And oh, yeah. I didn't enjoy that at all, but it worked. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I did. It. And being a man is getting help. That's showing strength. Um, and you know we're all we're all better for it. So uh, we're going to get to some questions that we've had uh, some listeners ask in. And um, Canadian Cancer Society, thank you to them for their support. They're with us. Um, and there's been some questions too as well. Again, all this stuff is on anxietycanada.com, uh, or you can go to Twitter at, ang at anxiety underscore Canada. Uh, you can find all this there. Um, but as far as uh, it's one of the questions we have from uh, Canadian Cancer Society is. We're talking about people that are going back to work. And listen, we touched a little bit on this last week, but we'll just, we'll kind of revisit it. 
uh, for anybody that wasn't watching, but uh, Henry, some coping strategies for people that have a, a mental health impact at home. Uh, we talked about routine a little bit, uh, different things you can do with everything opening up. It's going to be overwhelming for people. Everybody's, it's going to be, I, I think it's going to be like, you know, people, everybody's trying to get stuff done back to work. How do you deal with that stress and anxiety when you're working from home? So the, whether you're going to be working from home still or whether you're going to go back to work, I think what everyone needs to do, honestly, is begin each day with self-soothing. And it's got to be unique to you. So talk about guys. My husband has been you know, pent up. I got him each morning at six. He gets up and he now takes a 20-minute walk outside just to stretch his legs, get exercise, you know, move around a bit, clear his head. And it has made such a difference for him in coping with working at home, a guy who loves to be at his office. Think about for you, maybe it's meditation. Maybe it's for me, I've been doing yoga every morning. Good gosh, I never did yoga in my life. And now I've been doing yoga. It's like I'm on day like 22 of yoga. Um, what would it be for you to start your day where you are centered you know, you, you breathe, do some deep breathing and, and to get then into your routine, because then the day is going to be what it's going to be. It's going to be your meetings and such. Again, you've got to stay um, with some healthy habits, make sure you take breaks, make sure you're eating healthy through the day, get up and move around. And look, if you are going into the office, don't just like run into the office and hide in your office. You still, you got to use these things at office. How can you, at the office, you have to, how can you get a little bit of relaxation through the day? Not that you're like white knuckling it till five o'clock and running home. You've got to de-stress while you're there. So you can be productive in a healthy way and you can take care of your body. So I would look with these kinds of things, soothe yourself, uh, hydrate and eat well, make sure you're sleeping well, get exercise, right? And how you coach yourself is going to be so critical. Coaching back those worrisome thoughts with realistic, factual information of what could be helpful to you. I, I, lo I love yoga. Uh, meditation, I'm not so good at, but yoga, was, yoga is great. Uh, and for men, you know, men that don't think it's manly, yoga is one of the, one of the best things uh, I came across. And when I was single, there was girls in yoga. So I like that too. So that was perfect, <laughs> but we won't get into that, but we will get into relationships because that is another level. And Melissa, um, a question we have, uh, is, any tips for people who are having strained relationships and anxiety because of disagreements, you know, we're, you've been isolated with the same person. I think it's normal to be a, a little bit, uh, maybe a few more with whatever was gone through. Uh, some more disagreements or, or that, but anything uh, we can do tips to keep our relationships strong and healthy during this? Yeah, you know, um, uh, I have a theory that uh, the amount of strain in relationships is uh, directly related uh, or inversely related uh, to the size of your home. So uh, the more you're on top of each other, the more you're probably driving each other crazy. And uh, the bigger your place, the more you can kind of separate. Because we're not, I mean, we're not used to sort of being um, in each other's company all the time for such an extended period of time. And everyone is more anxious. So you have, you know, like in any kind of couple or, um, uh, you know, uh, also factor in if you have kids, everyone is anxious, everyone is frustrated, everyone has ants in their pants about like wanting to get out. And so you're much more irritable and you're more likely to argue uh, just in general, right? So I think a part of it is really acknowledging that, okay? That, you know, part of the reason why we are arguing more and our relationship is so strained is because we are getting on each other's nerves because everyone's getting on each other's nerves. Um, I'd say one thing is, and you know, um, I, I cannot say enough how much I agree with Anne-Marie when she talks about like self-soothing or self-care. That's, that is so important. It's weird how we consider that, um, you know, um, optional, you know, it's like, yeah. well, you know, like I take time for that, like when I have time, but when I'm really busy or stressed, 
um, you know, like I don't have time to do that. And by the way, self-care can include like, you know, uh, you just making a nice meal for yourself. And like, when, and when we get stressed, if you ever listen to people talk, like when they're stressed, it's like, well, you know, normally I like to go to the gym, but I've just had a lot of deadlines at work. So I haven't gone for a couple of weeks and I've mostly just been eating like takeout pizza and, you know, like, so we sort of cut back on anything that has to do with self-care, right? But self-care is like a spoon that empties out the cup of like stress and anxiety, just to make sure that it's not overflowing, right? So with that notion, it's like strained, you know, like, um, you know, like strained couples, uh, you know, like strained relationships, some of it is you both might have to increase your self-care and sometimes it might be together and sometimes it might very deliberately be apart. Like you go walk over there and I'm gonna walk over here. All right. And I'm going to talk to my friends and you're going to talk to your friends. And you know what? Like, and then we're going to come back and kind of get along a bit better. Um, and by the way, I would completely echo the notion that um, Anne-Marie said that everybody's self-care is really individual. Like, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes people will say that, right? Like, oh, you should do yoga or you should exercise, you should run, things like that. And those are great self-cares, but that's not, that's not the right thing for everyone. So, you know, so like when I think of running, you know, like I have some clients who'll say, you know what, when I'm really stressed, boy, I tell you, I go for a run and it's just great. And I just feel so much better. And I have other people um, who I see her, who basically will tell you, yeah, I run only when chased. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm with you. <laughs> um, you know, it's like, and so for, you know, like for other people, it's like, it's like a bow bath or it's watching a movie or, you know, like it's having, you know, like, uh, like tea on your patio, like in, you know, like in a favorite chair or it's doing a puzzle or whatever. Right. You should, but you got to find your thing and it's preferable to have more than one type of thing. And you need to kind of invest in that, like heavy energy and self-care because everyone's anxiety and frustration is like up to here. And don't, don't, don't overthink the fact that you're strained. It doesn't mean this must mean we were never meant to be. It's like, no, we were probably never meant to be on top of each other 24 seven, but it doesn't necessarily mean that this means this is, you know, just showing the flaws in our relationship. Basically don't overinterpret. Yeah. And, and well, like in building, if Go I ahead, could just build on that, Melissa, too, um, also think about with the pandemic and the way things have been, we've been stuck at home on top of each other, as Melissa's saying, what if you as a couple or even as a family lost because you can't do date night? How many couples always had date night? Well, maybe you're not doing that, right? Um, or family pizza night and you go out, okay, let's get it back in. You can still do this at home. You can do these things. So set up that you're going to have a romantic dinner you make together and the wine and the candles and the whole nine yards, whatever you do, do things like that. We like, I don't know if I told you this last time, but I bought a portable ping pong set and my husband and I play ping pong on the dining room table. Now it's hysterically funny. There's, there's different things that you can find to do together to nurture your relationship and the same thing with your kids. And I love seeing all these videos. Now there's grandparents on TikTok with the kids, whatever, get them together because these are the things as Melissa is saying, it's about what's unique to you, your relationship, your family that you can recreate and make happen or find new things to happen. That's gonna keep you going. Yeah, you guys are both gonna get me in a lot of trouble right now, by the way. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it's uh, no some great uh -oh. advice. Relationships are work, and I think that you have yeah. to find other ways. That's great. And uh, it, Melissa, and I'll just I, I touched on this last week, and uh, I'll touch on it again. But I know that, and I, this isn't a PSA, but uh, I know that alcohol does not help. Uh, it does not help right. in a relationship in a situation, and and things can escalate if you know a couple's been drinking. Just uh, so Melissa, I'll just I'll just I, I guess in a way uh, I'll try to ask you. How does alcohol affect decision making and in terms of anxiety and something like this? And and I think it's okay to have a glass of wine, whatever, relax. I mean, we were all in moderation, but right now, uh, overdoing the alcohol in a relationship can't help. Yeah, you know, um, alcohol and marijuana, they have very similar properties in the sense that they're both system depressants, right? So there are things, for example, that a lot of times people uh, will take to feel less anxious, right? You know, um, and in that case, it's a self-medicating thing. So this is what I mean. Like when I say that anxiety, um, that um, alcohol and marijuana share things in common, 
What I mean is that they can both be self-medicating, which in that case is not a good thing because that's going to create more problems, but they can also be things that you do um, in a pleasurable way, right? There's a world of difference between having a glass um, 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 of wine um, with, you know, like when you're chatting with your friends on Zoom and, and, you know, like, and you're having a good time versus being really anxious and stressed and, you know, like I, I need to have a couple of drinks so that, you know, I don't have to feel feelings. Um, that's, you know, like, that's not a good thing. I mean, I think that goes without saying, obviously your decision-making not going to be one, um, you know, um, if you've had, um, uh, um, a few drinks, it's not going to help you with problem solving and it's not going to help you with your anxiety. Okay. Um, in general, uh, but I say the same thing, like I said, with alcohol and with marijuana, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing, you know what, like that, uh, a lot of people are like, well, I'm drinking a little bit more in the evening, nothing wrong with that. But if, but, but if you're doing that because I'm anxious and I, you know, like, and I can't handle it, or I don't know how to deal with this. I just don't want to think about it. You know, that's, that's not the good way to go. Yeah. And that also will interfere with your ability to get good sleep, which you need, right. especially at times like this. I think actually too, Corey and Melissa, this opens up a little bit of, there are people who are very vulnerable out there to, at this point of, you know, with the pandemic to drinking or using substances mm -hmm. um, and, and they're getting themselves in trouble. And so what we would really ask people to pay attention to is taking stock of that. And is it time then to reach out really to um, substance use uh, counselors or programs that are all going online and are online to help? I think too, the other thing is we've been on the topic of um, family and couples. We do know that you know there are some who are having great difficulty with aggression and anger. Um, and various things. Again, we, you don't need to be unsafe. You don't need to be afraid. Um, you've got to please find a way to call um, to mental health centers and other places that you can get help. Don't sit with this and think, well, these people are saying this stuff to me, but it doesn't apply. It doesn't work because we're that bad or it's so severe here. There is help for everyone out there, but you've got to make the connection to folks who are local who can help you out. Uh, great reminder. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And again, all this information can be found on anxietycanada.com, on Twitter, at anxiety underscore Canada. Uh, just such a, a great day today we're having, I think, in a, just a, a ton of information. Um, and again, this isn't an alcohol or PSA. We're not trying to, but it is, uh, you know, it's sometimes it's like throwing gasoline on the fire, and that doesn't help anybody. Uh, so moderation is, is, is something that we all can uh, adhere to, I think. Uh, another question we have, and this I, I think this is a great question. It goes back to uncertainty, going back to work. Rules are going to be relaxed. Um, you know, if an employer isn't following guidelines, um, you know, how do you manage that uncertainty? How do you deal with that, Anne-Marie, of, of an employer, is your employer, you go back to work and they're not following the guidelines? Um, how does a, a person deal with something like that? And I, I guarantee we're going to see that coming forward uh, with what's happening right now. Oh, there's, I mean, you definitely can see that. Um, and there are uh, already in our country, you know, there's plenty of examples um, that we see on the news each night. And I think what people have to do there is you've got to band with the folks in your organization, your workplace, who are concerned and together because the stronger voices when there's more than one, you've got to make a, um, you know, a plea to say, look, we are not comfortable. This isn't right. Uh, these are, and, and not just say that something has to happen, offer up what you think are the best solutions um, and not just one, but several, you know, this is always the thing that if there is someone there you're working under um, if that, if there is a problem, just going and saying, you know, you got to fix the fact that everybody is just talking and walking into each other's offices and nobody's wearing masks, you know, you got to fix that. That doesn't do anything except, you know, you're a complainer and it puts more stress on that person. But if you go in and you say, you know, I've been concerned about people coming into the offices. Could we please have some signs put up? Could we please make masks available? Could we please, you know, and, and so think of different things and strategies that could uh, be reasonable for the place where you work. 
course, folks are going to be anxious in this regard about bringing these things up. If they're concerned about seeing things lapse in terms of safety, they're going to be worried about their job getting cut then, because you can imagine an employer saying, fine, go work somewhere else. Um, so I can understand where people are going to be very anxious about that. The one thing that I think an employer can't do is stop you from wearing protective gear and doing what you need to do to protect yourself in terms of in your workspace. So bear in mind that, have your own mask, your own goggles, your own gloves and sanitizer. Uh, and that's going back to work is going to be uncertain for all of us. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of other things that, that go along with that. And that's, some, that's a great answer on what to do, because I know there are people, there'll be people afraid. There'll be people afraid to speak up. Like, what am I going to lose my job? What, you know, that's another uncertainty, anxiety. And, uh, you know, if it's not right, your health and safety is at the first and foremost concern. And we have rules in place that'll, that'll help everybody. Um, we'll move on to another question that I have here. So Melissa, this is a great question because I, I've, I've dealt with this a little bit in, in some of the stuff that I've done uh, uh, in the last couple of weeks, and this is connected to seniors. Um, there's seniors that aren't online. And I don't think a lot of people, um, I, you know, we, we assume that everybody's online. Uh, what suggestions for seniors um, that, what can they do that are not connected online or are not like tech savvy or that, you know, have trouble reaching out during a crisis like this? Well, you know, um, Actually, Anne Marie had talked about this um, last time that it, you know, that it is incumbent upon us to sort of um, be a bit more, you know, like sort of community oriented. So that if there are if there are seniors, um, you know, like that you know and in your community, uh, mm -hmm. to make a point of sort of reaching out to them because it, because if, of of exactly that they might not have the technological resources, and you know, uh, you know they're depending on their physical health, they might not be able um, uh, to, you know, um, uh, to leave their homes, etc. But, you know, I would say that even if they don't, you know, like if they're not online, they're probably listening to the news and, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, watching television. And usually there will be mention of resources um, for seniors and volunteer organizations. And I'm happy to say that there are several of those, I'd say, you know, like um, um, in most places and that, you know what, to avail yourself of those resources. You know, it's sometimes, you know, it's, it's I'm going to be overly philosophical and like, you know, but it's like, you know, everything in life is about like reciprocity. And sometimes we give a bit more and sometimes we take a bit more and there's nothing. And that's just, that's just healthy. It's in relationships, that's in everything. And, you know, um, you know, like I can think about, you know, like the seniors that are, you know, um, in my own family, many of which are very proud and the idea of having to ask for help and it's like no but that's okay you know it's it's sometimes we have to do that right um so that's why i'm saying it's usually a good idea if you can reach out to people before they have to reach out to you you know so you know any seniors just just sort of check in and you and there's any in your building just knock on their door and ask if you know like if there's anything that you can do to help and be concrete right you know like listen i'm gonna go pick up some groceries so if you have anything, you give me your list and I'll go, you know, anyone you need me to check in on or things like that. Concrete, concrete suggestions are always going to be best. We've had some, there has been some wonderful humanity things come out of this and I've, I've, we've yeah. seen that a little bit, which is great. Uh, we'll have time for one last question here. Uh, Anne-Marie, this is for you. Uh, this question is directed at you for sure, because um, I actually just had a friend with a newborn baby who, uh, was online and showed her baby and what a time to have a baby. Oh my God. Yeah. It's just, so there's all sorts of uh, anxiety around that. There's not a lot of info about parents. Uh, babies are still being born. <laughs> babies don't care whether there's COVID or not. So babies are still being born. What advice do you have for a newborn parent? Um, one of the things actually, and I've, I've dealt with a couple of soon to be parents who became parents during this time. One of the things is family members, whether it's going to be grandma or auntie or uncle, whoever, sequester yourself now in the sense that you want your family members who you're going to want, especially if you want, if for, new, for a new mother, they often want their mother with them. And sorry to the dads and the, or other moms in the situation, but they want their mother to move in for a period of time to help them. 
these folks have to put themselves in isolation for two weeks so that they can know for sure that they can be around the baby and the mom. So that's one of the very first things that everybody has to think of. Who are you going to want to be with? And I also have seen um, expectant parents move in with the family that they want to stay with prior to the baby coming. That's one thing. You do have to be more prepared. You wanna have as many pampers in the house and various things like that ahead of time. The big thing is trust yourself. Trust yourself and if you have a partner, trust your partner that you're gonna be sharing responsibilities just like you would if you were both gonna be home for family leave. You're gonna be sharing in who's up all night and various things. You're just gonna keep the visitors at a distance. You're gonna have them outside looking through the picture window as if they were going to the nursery at the hospital a little bit longer and waving and saying, ooh, at the baby, but you're not gonna be putting that baby in anyone's arms unless they have had that period of where they have made sure that they're not carrying it, uh, you know, and had the virus. Yeah, thank you, Emory. Uh, we've got about five minutes left here. So another great, uh, another great hour with you guys. This is, uh, I'm getting so much myself, so much information. Um, it, uh, Melissa, I'll just ask you any, any last words of encouragement, advice, um, anything that you felt is we need to repeat or we need to, we talked about today that, uh, you might have for the viewers that can, uh, last words of advice or encouragement. Well, you know, I'm based in BC and right now, you know, we are going through, um, uh, a new normal where things are being opened and that's great, uh, um, in many ways, but it's a new, it's a new layer of uncertainty and a new layer of anxiety. And I think, you know, it's one is you just, you know, like you're, we all have to accept that we're going to have a lot of uncertainty for a while. That's not going away. The new normal is kind of similar to the old normal in that way. And that a lot of uncertainty and a lot of anxiety and that's okay. Um, and that we're going to have to balance. I mentioned this before, um, you know, uh, we're going to have to balance risk uh, and um, our sort of, you know, like our risk tolerance uh, with the cost of it, right? You know, um, and that everyone's going to have, everyone's going to have a different idea of what is normal or what is appropriate for them. And I would say that that's, that um, what people choose, as long as it's coming from their own rational mind and it's a thoughtful process is the right thing. Right. So if somebody is more hesitant to go back to work than you, that doesn't mean that they're making the right decision or the wrong decision. They're just making their own decision. So you don't have to look at everyone else and go, well, my neighbor's going or my colleague thinks it's OK. So maybe I'm just overreacting. Right. It's OK to differ and to recognize that where we are all going to cope with this uncertainty in slightly different ways. Now, thank you, Anne-Marie. I'd say one of the things to do is go to Anxiety Canada and download that Mind Shift app. Yes. Because I love that app um, because there's so much right at your fingertips for helping you to cope with uncertainty, remind you to do your self care and deep breathing, um, and just be able to move through your day with much more, you know, feelings of competency in managing your anxiety and let yourself feel. Let yourself feel exactly. We all can feel the same thing. And I'll, I'll, I'll touch a little bit on uh, masculinity again, because it's such a big topic, especially during this. Uh, when I think of masculinity, I think of guys like Kevin Love, Michael Phelps, Brian Dawkins, they're all professional athletes. Brian Dawkins is a Hall of Famer, suffers with depression, uh, has come forward with his story. Kevin Love, NBA players come forward with his story. Uh, and Michael Phelps, 23 gold medals that suffers from depression and he's come forward with his story. Uh, some of the manliest men that I've ever <laughs> come across. So if you think that you're being a man suffering in silence, you're only hurting yourself. Um, and I'll touch on this lastly too as well. If you're having suicidal thoughts uh, during times like this, uh, know that you're not alone. Uh, there are suicide hotlines out there. Uh, again, all that information, anxietycanada.com uh, at anxiety underscore Canada on Twitter, uh, the mind shift app. Thank you, Anne Marie for mentioning that. Uh, Melissa, another great episode. Great job. Both of you really enjoy all the advice and, and everything. And I hope everybody gets out of this uh, with comes out of with something. I, I don't know how you couldn't. There's just been so much great information, but uh, join us next week. 
Uh, it'll be uh, for another episode for with Melissa and Anne Marie, and uh, we're going to have Dr. Maureen Whittle. Uh, will be back with us next week. Uh, it's been uh, an, an unbelievable episode today. Just so much, uh, like I said, and again, you can get it at anxiety.com, anxiety underscore Canada at Twitter. Uh, you can find me at Corey Hirsch Twitter. You can find me on Instagram at Corey Hirsch 72. Um, and go get Anne Marie's book, right? We never put <laughs> the book for it. Thank you. <laughs> Melissa, do you have the book? A three. You got oh. three. Where can we find those on Amazon? Well, yes, you can find them on uh, Amazon. And one's about worry and one's about generalized anxiety. Oh, uh, and awesome. I got them. Ah. <laughs> well, thank you both, and we'll see you again next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.